Hi everyone. Are you psyched about Barbie? I'm super excited about Barbie. And for that reason, we're gonna give you a little Barbie tutorial, everyone. I was looking for my daughter's Barbie sunglasses. I, I'm trying to be Malibu Barbie, but without much success. I put on pink lipstick. Hi guys, I put on a pink shirt. We're gonna give you a little Barbie tutorial because everybody's pretty jazzed about the Barbie movie that opens on Friday. Anyway, are you guys going to the Barbie movie this weekend? I'm trying to go to both, but I don't know if I can get a ticket. Hi, is this Andrea? Hi, Andrea. Hi, Katie, how are you? I'm fine. By the way, I loved your documentary. You're so talented. You wrote, produced, and directed it. You wrote, oh, by the way, this is Andrea Nevins. Is it Andrea or Andrea? Andrea. Andrea. Anyway, Andrea is an Academy Award nominated, Emmy Award winning director, producer, and writer of the documentary called Tiny Shoulders, Rethinking Barbie. And we thought it would be fun to just basically, hi everybody, to, to just chat with uh, Andrea for a few minutes about the Barbie craze and how she felt about the Barbie film, which you've already seen, right, Andrea? Yeah, that's very lucky. Okay, first of all, A, how did you get to see it early? And B, what did you think of the movie? Uh, well, you might think that because I spent so much time at Mattel, that was my method, but no, I had to I had to beg like everybody else. Um, I had a friend who worked at Warner Brothers and he snagged me a couple of tickets way off on the side, but I was so happy to be in the nice. room. So what did you think of the film? Um, in short, I loved it. It's funny it's irreverent it's a film through the female gaze like i don't think we've seen before uh because everybody knows about the barbie world right and if you really think about it the barbie world is a world created by girls or by 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 boys or by others who want to be in that particular kingdom or queendom and uh and it is entirely that so ken who's always been an accessory is the ultimate accessory in this movie Everything is from the point of view or from the opinion of women. It's so fun and funny. And obviously, Greta Gerwig is a brilliant director. I love Greta. I had a chance to interview her for my podcast, and um, she's got she's so original and interesting. And can you kind of give us the overall plot of the movie for people, you know, that won't spoil it, but can help people before they see the film? Um, I'll, I'll try without giving a spoiler. Um, so Barbie, uh, Bar Barbie has some, some, she's living in her world, right? And it's a perfect world and every day is incredibly fun um, in the way that you would live in a world that's a child's view of, of what it means to be uh, feminine and playful and free. And, uh, but she does have this connection with the people who play with her. And, uh, and somehow or another, that connection grows stronger. And suddenly, some of the attributes of Barbie start to fall away. And she has to, she goes on a mission, a quest to figure out what went wrong and why some of the things that she loves about herself seem to be disappearing. And the way that she goes about doing that and what she finds is such a, um, a kind of surprising triumph of figuring out what it means to be feminine in our culture and the contradictions that exist within that, it ends up being a very clever comment on who we are, which is so great because that is who Barbie has been in her 60 year history. She's been a lightning rod of gender roles, body images, beauty myths, everything that we've struggled with, all the contradictions that we struggle with as women. And I was I was gonna say, Andrea, I feel like people have different perspectives on Barbie. You know, some people think she was a progressive avatar. Other people think she was obviously uh, the epitome and the embodiment of unrealistic beauty standards. And, you know, what, yeah, someone said, I didn't know it was that deep. I actually think it, you know, I was reading a Time Magazine piece. I didn't read the whole thing, but they were saying the movie sort of lacked depth. But um, uh, I, I don't think that's necessarily true. Do you? No, absolutely not. Um, at least, you know, I was I was in an audience of the pre-converted, so to speak. Uh -huh. um, they were all Barbie fans. And, uh, and I will say at a climactic moment, there's such an overwhelming cheer as uh, as all these contradictions of what it means to be a woman are recited 
uh, that we couldn't hear the next line. So I'm, I'm dying to go back on Friday to see it again um, because it really nails some essential truths, but with a wink and a nod and a sense of humor, which is often the best form of, uh, of getting a point across. I have to ask you about Ryan Gosling as Ken. He seems like he is so damn funny in that role. He is so funny. And what's great about it is that he's playing um, an, an antithetical version of Ryan Gosling, right? So he has always been the dreamboat, right? In every movie, he's just so lovely. Um, everybody's image of what you would want in a man. And uh, if that's what you're looking for. and um, uh, and in this, he plays not only the sidekick, but he can't exist without Barbie on his arm. He is Barbie and Ken. There is no Ken. There's just Barbie and Ken. There's Barbie and there's Barbie and Ken. And so for him to play against type in that way is just automatically funny, but he plays it so well. His longing to be looked at in a way that women had to grapple with for so many years uh, in order to literally have an income, right? You had to be that beautiful Barbie-like image in order to attract a man, in order to pay for your life. Yeah. And he's in that role. He's in that role. I, it's hysterical. And is he kind of an airhead? He, uh, he's a, yes, he's an airhead because his, oh my God, I don't want to give it away. It's too good a joke. Okay, don't, don't, don't worry. <laughs> we, we, we can all wait. We'll just wait. And I think it's fun to go to into a movie and not know too much about it. So you're surprised and delighted by, you know, it, and it looks like just a, a Technicolor explosion of pink, right? That's why I wore my pink t-shirt in. I, oh, God. I, I wore purple. I don't quite have the right pink, but. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right. It. Well, one of the reasons we wanted to talk to Andrea, everybody, is because she was the producer, writer, and director of this documentary five years ago that came out in 2018 called Tiny Shoulders Rethinking Barbie. So fun to watch for the cultural commentary, but also just watching them put together Barbie and seeing behind the scenes at Mattel, how they were trying to upgrade Barbie. Somebody by that way asked me if I had a Barbie. You know, I had a Midge doll. Do you remember Midge? Totally, and you're, you're kind of a Midge. Don't you think? I like, kind of, I'm kind of a midge. And I'm kind of a Marianne, not a gender. I'm kind of a midge, not a Barbie. And But I was kind of mad at my mom for giving me a bar, Barbie's kind of, let's be honest, less attractive friend, Andrea. Well, you're not the less attractive friend, but she was a bombshell. And I'm not sure that a lot of moms felt comfortable with that. So you might you might attribute that to her being protective maybe, of you. Maybe. But Midge had like a brown flip and freckles. And I also, my mom got me Scooter instead of Skipper. Now, Skipper was Barbie's little sister, but Scooter was her friend. She came in a little sailor outfit with pigtails. And again, she looked like a female Alfred E. Newman, kind of. <laughs> but, but cute rather than a... No. Than she, she was cute. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be disparaging <laughs> of Skipper. But I always thought it was so funny that my mom didn't get me Barbie and Scooter. She gave me Midge and Skipper, although she did give me a Francie doll for Christmas one year. Huh. Okay, did you so have, do, you, do you remember Francie? I totally remember all of them. I only had I only had a Barbie. Yeah. With the trolls and the G.I. Joes. It was a whole... You know, I have world. a lot of trolls too, but anyway, hilarious, but all right, enough about me and my skipper and midge dolls, which maybe kind of made me, I don't know, we, we, I'll talk about it with my therapist, Andrea, but let's talk about <laughs> Tiny Shoulders. Why did you want to make a movie about Barbie? You know, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who works at Mattel. I live in Los Angeles, so there are a lot of people who work at Mattel, and um and she said, I asked her how she was, and she said she was great. She was waking up every morning, and she couldn't wait to get to work because they were at this pivot point with Barbie uh, where they really had to think about, was she going to disappear from the planet, or could she? they reinvent her in such a way that she would fit better into where we were as a culture? And that that was a very exciting thing to be part of because they were really digging deep and talking about who women are today and where they should be going and what little girls should be dreaming about. And uh, and she said that, and I called her the next morning and said, I want to make a documentary about this because I 
think there's no better way to look at the last 60 years of feminism than through the lens of this doll. Um, and, uh, and it took seven months to get inside of Mattel because they had never let anybody inside before. The toy industry is incredibly competitive. And so people just, you know, you just have to sign your life away as soon as you walk inside those doors. And so to have cameras there was going to be tricky, but they were at a low point. And sometimes when you're at a low point, you want to stay honest and, uh, and be authentic and having cameras there forces you to do that. And so they were willing to take a big risk and have us film, even though they had no idea whether this experiment was gonna work. Um, so that was the opportunity. Well, let, let, I mean, it was unbelievable. Uh, Adriana, who's sitting next to me, who works with me, um, we were saying how what incredible access you were given. It was so funny, even in the opening credits, to see them painting the Barbie dolls' faces and to see them like putting the hair in the Barbie dolls, that was so crazy. Right. And and um, tell us a little bit about, I, I wanna talk about sort of what Barbie stood for and stands for and how they retooled her for a modern world. But first I wanna talk about Ruth Handler, cause I know you're working on a feature film, I understand with Rita Wilson about the woman who invented Barbie and she in of her in and of herself was a real character I mean a real woman in a man's world and she wanted she really worked hard and against a lot of naysayers to create a a an adult doll because up until then there had only been baby dolls that taught girls how to nurture and these were suddenly dolls that allowed little girls to project their hopes and dreams about what they wanted to be, even if the measurements were uber unrealistic. So tell us a little bit about Ruth, Andrea. Uh, she was kind of an extraordinary, feisty, wonderful woman who, um, who was more of the business brains in this partnership with her husband, Elliot. Uh, he was more the creative did who built things and um and so she was unafraid of being a woman in a man's world in part because she had this partnership with her husband and so was protected but once she invented barbie for all those reasons that you're talking about dolls had been baby dolls she as a working woman wanted girls to be able to dream about that even though that opportunity wasn't accessible yet there weren't that many women doctors. There were certainly no female astronauts, but she really had this sense that if you can dream it, you can be it. And what an unusual thing. Um, and this doll took off even against everybody saying there was no way that anybody's gonna buy a doll with breasts. Um, and, uh, and it became a, her company became a Fortune 500 company and she was running it. She was a CEO before in the 60s. It's just kind of unheard of. Um, but a variety of things happened to her. She um, uh, had breast cancer, um, quite a severe form, and a double a mastectomy and then a double mastectomy. And during that period, um, there were men running the company and there was fraud that happened. And of course, she should have overseen it, but she got kicked out of the company because of it. And she went on to invent a whole other very specific through the female gaze thing which were breast prostheses there were no breast prostheses that looked natural and she went on to make a whole other fortune with these, these breast prostheses called nearly me um which is just kind of she's an amazing human being she really i mean she was an incredible woman and you obviously you hear a lot from her in the documentary you got a hold of an interview she had done with connie chung which was really fun to to look at and to just hear her talking because she was really ahead of her time, which makes me wonder, I mean, you, you talk about the contradictions of Barbie, but in many ways she was, the doll was quite progressive. She was an astronaut in her, uh, in, in, in I think it was like 1968 or something. What? 65 she yeah. was an astronaut she did uh she was a doctor they put her in roles that were very much ahead of her time correct absolutely and again and again and again she's been president multiple times yeah <laughs> she has. Female president. 
We could use Barbie to run for president today, maybe. After you see this movie, you're going to want her to be president. Really? <laughs> <laughs> but um, what? where do you come down on sort of was she, um, was she limiting for little girls because of her appearance or was she, she uh, expansive for them in terms of their ambitions. She was balancing many different um, elements of what it means to be a woman and it kind of depends on where you came from as a little girl as to how you could interpret this doll. Um, again and again and again, I saw places in culture where she was mimicking what was happening. So for example, there was a doll in the 60s that came with a scale that was permanently set to 110 and a book that said, um, how do you lose weight? And on the back of it, it said, don't eat. Now that's right. just a horrifying message to send to little girls. The flip side is I found commercial after television commercial after television commercial of, for example, diet drinks that basically said, you're not going to get a man unless you're skinny. And if you don't get a man, you're going to be a failure. So that was out there too. And they were kind of in lockstep, the Barbie doll, the invention of Barbie doll, what she was in many ways, as well as advancing the story of women. Um, I don't think I actually answered your question. No, no, answer. no, no, that's okay. Um, I mean, you can, you can tell us, I mean, I, I think you're right. I mean, it's a mixed bag, right? <laughs> By the way, people are asking, yes, it's called Tiny Shoulders, Rethinking Barbie, and it's on Hulu, if anybody wants to watch it. Um, but what you said, I mean, it's it just, it, she's a mixed bag, right? His mixed bag, and, and, and we still haven't figured out how we want to perceive femininity in our culture, and she is the lightning rod for all of those mixed emotions. Let's talk about sort of how they tried to iterate Barbie. Didn't they try to make a larger size Barbie? And, I mean, they experimented with Barbie through the years, and certainly uh, she became much more multicultural. Uh, when did sort of that happened. There was a black Barbie, there still is a black Barbie. And, and tell us about kind of why Mattel, which, which by the way, this couple started, right? They started Mattel, Elliot and uh, I forget, sorry, Ruth Handler started Mattel. But um, tell me, tell me uh, how they started changing Barbie's look and becoming more modern and not just having the the very well we talked about midge but how they expanded barbie i'm going to fix this there have been changes over time um that may have been imperceptible but uh but they were absolutely trying to keep step with culture so yes they had a they had a black barbie in the 60s um that was something that ruth really cared a lot about she in fact invested in a black doll company in uh in watts um she felt it was important that there was representation for everyone um even though it doesn't seem that way. And she was, the doll was reviled for that. But one example of a change was that uh, the original Barbie looked down. She, her eyes were downcast. And during the, uh, the, um, dur during, during the 1970s, um, during the, the beginning of the second wave of feminism, uh, her eyes were cast up and she looked directly at the girl she was playing with. So there were little changes like that that were really clearly demarcating where we were as a culture. So it was clear that uh, there was an embracing at the end of the 2000s of, uh, of what it means to be in a body that's not just that movie star, classic movie star body. And, uh, and they started talking about it and they experimented with the idea of a curvier doll. And, um, and we were able to see some of those tapes where they, they allowed little girls to play with the dolls, but the girls rejected them. The girls had been, so, little girls had been so inculcated with this idea that it's not pretty to be curvy, um, that, that Mattel was afraid they wouldn't be bought. They would sit on the shelves and that would just be a travesty. That's terrible. And, uh, Isn't it's that, that's a really um, sad, sad commentary about, uh, you know, sort of how little girls are, as you say, conditioned to think what is pretty and what is not. The fact that they didn't want, and so what happened to those Barbies? Did they decide not, because I remember covering that, I thought, Andrea, that they were gonna make 
Barbies that had less unrealistic measurements. So they ended up doing it. That was one of the great things that we were able to, to, to cover while we were inside Mattel. They decided in 2015, when they were at a real low point, that they had to now embrace this change. They were really afraid that nobody was going to, no, no parent was going to buy, no millennial mom was going to buy this doll. Um, it was just so out of step. And so they were willing to take this risk and they not only changed her so that she was in many, many colors with many different hair types, but also three different body types. The kind of more classic one, which had, by the way, gotten more athletic over time. It had originally been, it had originally been based on the Dior model of the 50s. And those were the kinds of clothes that Ruth envisioned her wearing. And so she had to have a tiny waist and uh, and broader hips and a bigger bust because that those were the clothes. And she clothes. didn't have any, but she didn't have any hips. I mean, Barbie, but the original, relative, relative to her waist, bit, but not really tiny, tiny. So the idea was that like our fabric is so much heavier on that size of a doll that you couldn't actually create a small looking waist. Unless the waist, unless her waist was that much smaller than ours, um, so it was really just a kind of a mannequin idea, to to so that the clothes looks normal. Uh, but they began to change her, and over time she got more athletic, a little less booby, and a little more um, uh, strong looking, but not not to the effect that people would really notice it because that subject had become very noisy. Um, and so they made this they made this this huge. Um, change for them and i say huge in part because it was brave because they were afraid they would lose money and they're a business um but also because it meant changing all kinds of things that had been built into this play over 60 years so for example if you had a barbie that you wanted to give to your daughter you would know that the shoes would fit the new one and the old one and there was something really lovely about that mother daughter or mother son or whoever was playing with the dolls that they could share that and more than that, they had bathtubs and elevators and doorways that these dolls had to fit into, and all of that had to be changed. So it wasn't just a simply making her a little wider. It was a lot of things that had to happen. Right, right. And so um, what, you know, you went behind the scenes with Mattel, and we, don't, we want people to watch your documentary, but can you tell us a little bit more about how they adjusted Barbie for the modern world? Um, so they made her um, what they called curvier and uh, and we got to watch them ideate on that whole idea because they had to name her something. Because if they didn't name this curvier doll, she would become fat Barbie. And they really didn't want that um, because girls relate to these dolls and you just don't want the terrible monikers that are given to women applied to a young girl, anyone, but particularly to a young girl who's trying to figure out who she is in the world. Um, so they named her Curvy because they felt like that had some cultural, cool cultural cachet. Um, and, uh, and there was some advertising out there, like the Dove Real Body but, ad. And, or, and also that, that was sort of the advent of more plus size models um, like Ashley Graham and being beautiful in all different kinds of bodies. And that was when that was really exploding, right? Exactly. And so there was an acceptance. And again, Barbie rides these waves. And this was the, this was the beginning of a wave. And they took that and it, it ended up being incredibly successful and so successful that during the pandemic, Barbie sales went up in a way that they hadn't in eons. In fact, they may have been higher than ever. Um, I think in large part because, uh, because parents really wanted wanted kids to, to have imaginative play and not just be on their computers all day. And, uh, and that imaginative play is so healthy. And while the doll has been controversial and some people say it's not a healthy kind of play, I ended up thinking after being inside and watching this happen that until women really have a full, a full deck, whether it's that they can tell a story, a complete story for themselves and live it, you still need to deal with that being president. Absolutely. And how is, I, I, I was going to ask you, you were saying that, that they did very well. I, I, it's been a long time since I bought my daughter's Barbies. Uh, I, I don't even know where their Barbies are. They might be downstairs, but um, 
I even bought Ellie a life-sized Barbie that I used to have to put in the overhead compartment when we traveled. And uh, it was so, honestly, so weird. I don't even know why I bought her that, but she seemed to like it for a while. And how is the Barbie business doing? And what do you think this film is going to, will be, do, will, will do for Mattel and for Barbies everywhere? Uh, I'm not, I'm not really a business reporter, but it seems to me she will gain acceptance again in a way that she hasn't had in a long time. And, and in such a positive way, I mean, in a way I think that she deserves. Um, but I'm, but I do fear a backlash, you know, whenever we as women take a few strides forward, there's always a backlash. So let's hope that this is a big enough stride that it doesn't go too much farther yeah. back. Yeah. I, I, I can't wait to see the film. And I think Margot Robbie was brilliant casting. And, uh, but I, as I said, I want to see Oppenheimer too. So I feel like I'm not just in, inhaling pink, you know, <laughs> cotton candy. Although, as you said, it has some serious themes in it too. Without a doubt. Without anyway, doubt. such a talented filmmaker. It's so nice to meet you. And um, good luck with all your projects. I would love to talk to you about collaborating on something that I'm thinking Please. about. Um, so I'll, I'll email you. But anyway, uh, thanks for doing this, Andrea. The documentary Andrea did, again, is called Tiny Shoulders Rethinking Barbie. It's on Hulu. It's a great, I think, uh, primer before you go see the film to just kind of get yourself in the Barbie mode and to understand kind of the cultural impact that this, how big is she? She's how many inches tall? 11 and a half. 11 and a half inch plastic female avatar has had on our culture. Anyway, Andrea, thanks again. It's great Thank to meet you. you. You too. Okay, bye, bye everybody. everybody. See ya.